afternoon. The time is two minutes past one in the UK. Good afternoon and welcome to How to Successfully Sell in China through WeChat webinar. Brought to you by the Great British Food Programme and Business West in partnership with Regroup Media, Elanders Group, NJ Acres and Co Limited and China British Business Council. My name is Mark and I work for the international team here at Business West. Before we start today's webinar, here are some housekeeping points. If you're having any technical difficulties, please type them into the chat function and put them to your events team and I will endeavour to help. If you have any questions, please put them into the Q&A tab. We have allowed time for this at the end. And finally, please note this webinar will be recorded. As you can see from today's agenda, it is a very full and informative one. So we will start off by hearing about the complete solution from Business West's commercial director, James Monk. Over to you, James. There we go. Good afternoon. And uh, thank you for joining this webinar. I just thought I'd briefly introduce uh, who Business West is and how this all fits together. Uh, many of you, I think, have been dealing with us uh, for a number of years and will be familiar, but we're the uh, UK's largest chamber of commerce operating primarily in the southwest of England. And international trade is really at the core of what we do. Uh, not just in terms of promoting it, but in actually enabling it. Uh, we've got one of the UK's biggest teams in terms of producing all the export documentation, letters of credit, carnets, and with the interesting months approaching for us, all the new customs entries that we're going to have to be doing. We also deliver the uh, DIT contract and European funded international trade promotion for the southwest of England. So across the piece, we've got about 100 staff uh, dedicated to international trade. So really at the core of what we do for the region, but more and more of it is on a national basis. Now, food and drink is one of our region's leading products. And uh, we've been working on doing what every company wants to do, which is connecting buyers and sellers. And I must say thank you to Paul Abley. When we first started getting involved with our Meet the Buyer and the first round of the Great British Food Programme, I think you had a list in the back of an A4 pad of buyers and another list of sellers and how we were joining them together. That's escalated at a pace. Uh, and now we have one of the UK's, if not, I think we actually now are the UK's biggest online matching service for exporters with actual buyers overseas. And last year, we pulled off the phenomenal event at the Belfry uh, with more face-to-face -face meetings than had ever been done before in the UK in that sector. And uh, back then and before, we were looking at how we could do more and more of this online. COVID's come along, as we all know, and actually doing more and more things virtually and more and more e-commerce has suddenly become very much of the moment. But we'd been looking at how we could get companies into the Chinese markets for about two to three years now. And uh, it was difficult. And companies were saying to us, look, we know it's a huge market. We know it's growing at pace, but it's complicated. It's a long way away. It's a difficult market to penetrate into. We've got to protect our intellectual property. We've got to work out how we're going to get paid. And they kept on putting it into the too difficult box. And I must admit, we did as well because the sums of money that were being involved were very large and the element of risk was quite prevalent. But we kept on looking at it and we kept on thinking, how can we break this down into the component parts? How can we find partners who can help us deliver those component parts? And how can we get these companies into market? And we've used the analogy over the years that this is almost a bit of an incubator to get companies into the Chinese marketplace, try it out, get them exposed to that rapidly growing market that seems to love British products, British food and British drink. How can we break down those barriers? And I'm delighted that we've done that. And we're gonna to hear today from the partners that we've got on board how we've hopefully brought all of these pieces together. And 
originally when we set this webinar up a couple of months ago, I think we were looking at it as being a, a little bit of a sales piece to explain to companies why they should be part of it. I think we've actually progressed now to actually trying to whittle down the number of companies we can actually get on this first round because everyone's saying this is a fantastic solution. You've broken down the risks, you've made it easier, you've made it easier to understand the different elements and have a solution in there. So I'm not by any means saying we've got all the answers to everything, but I think you're going to hear today how we've hopefully got the answers to most of the bits and can hopefully get a lot more companies trading into the Chinese marketplace. But let me pass you on to some experts who really do know what they're talking about. Back to you, Mark. Thank you, James. Um, I'm now pleased to hand over to the Director, Consumer Economy UK Sector Lead for Food and Drink from China Britain Business Council, Antoinette Becker, who'll be introducing us to the Chinese market and the in-demand food and drink categories. Over to you, Antoinette. Thank you very much indeed, and good afternoon to everyone. Um, my name, as you heard, is Antoinette Becker, and I am the Director for Consumer Economy at the China Britain Business Council, as well as the food and drink specialist. Um, over 20 years of my life were spent in China, and um, I did enjoy a fair share of um, hard work, humble learning, and many, many delicious meals. Um, in response to what James was suggesting as China being um, a difficult market to crack, I would now um, say that it's also the world's biggest consumer um, and biggest importer of food, as well as having as a nation one of the finest culinary traditions um, and um, being a great gourmet connoisseur. So it's an absolute delight for me to be um, able to endorse today and support the um, WeChat store initiative of the Great British Food Program. Um, if you forgive me now, I will turn off my video as we move through the slides. I think this would improve a little bit the um, quality of the presentation. Next slide, please, Jenny. For those of you who do not know the China Britain Business Council, we are UK's largest membership organization of companies trading with the market. Um, we have a long and illustrious history of engagement with the market, over 60 years of it, and we have evolved um, with the market. Um, we now have a network of about 700 members across different sectors and staff spread across 10 offices in the UK and the 10 UK regions. Next slide, please. What do we do for companies in the food and drink sector specifically? Um, as the sector lead for it, um, you know, I have endeavored to work with the team to develop a um, solution um, offer for companies at different stage of market entry and growth in the market. That means covering all of the cycle from first exploration of the market. Is it the right market for us? Do our products have market access? Do they fit? Where do I start? Um, the B2B um, stage where we um, support with introduction of relevant partners, be it distributors, agents, retailers, or e-commerce platforms, all the way through nowadays to um, offering some business to consumer services in terms of live streaming e-commerce sales, um, WeChat promotions, etc. Next slide, please. Now, on the topic of the day, um, I think um, you're all um, very well uh, attuned to some uh, pretty impressive figures when it comes to the China market. Um, but here they are at a glance. Um, worth noting that um, it was the only export country for the UK food and drink producers that grew double digit um, last year. Um, at the moment, it is the world's, um, um, it is the Asia's largest grocery market, um, and it will become the, the biggest grocery market by 2023. I've used here the IGDs figures um, to um, make the predictions. Other um, forecasters um, predict that would be a little bit sooner. Next slide, please. 
So at the moment, the size of the, the size of the market combines the um, size of the other four Asian markets um, from um, South Korea to Japan and Vietnam. Um, and it is a market that is probably growing at a slower rate than India, uh, but predicted to uh, indeed take the top rank um, by 2023. Um, in a macro context, um, it is worth noting that China will be probably the only economy of G20 to finish 2018 with a positive GDP growth. At a um, top um, government conference in October, they have announced new measures to stimulate economic growth by boosting domestic consumption. Arguably, the Chinese market is the biggest in the world, so they're going to in, unveil more fiscal measures to support their consumers consuming. And that involves a lot of consumption of imported food and drink products. Next slide, please. Worth noting that in terms of e-commerce, China is already the world's largest e-commerce market worth 1.5 trillion this year. And this is the new normal of shopping experience and entertainment for our target Chinese consumers. Um, about 12%, um, according to our research, of that online consumption is imported. And a lot of it is focused on food and drink. Next slide, please. Here I've taken um, uh, a leaf out of IGD's research on um, who our members on the um, growth of the market, grocery market channels up to 2020. And you would see that the conventional routes to market for food and drink grocery products uh, will um, grow conservative in comparison to what online in grocery retail will reach by 2023. This is about 30% growth. To note that the research was done earlier this year before COVID accelerated the pivot towards online shopping even more. Next slide. Here I have um, combined a look at what the UK exported um, uh, in this year today. This was like the first half of 2019, according to FDF, to China. So you would see the main uh, product categories which we continue to sell successfully to the Chinese market. Um, in the overall context, the biggest categories that China imports to the market are aquatic products meat and dairy. So you would see there is a big growth of fresh produce um, that we export to the Chinese market al along with some of the branded products. Um, notice that there are a number of spirits brands that are joining us uh, here today. Um, obviously China is the biggest alcoholic um, consumption market in the world and even during COVID you would see that categories, niche categories like gene, for instance, um, recorded the positive um, growth in the market, although growing from a very um, low base. Next slide, please. Um, so um, COVID obviously um, had um, quite a substantial impact, not only on the uh, outlook of the um, retail and horeca channels, uh, but also on the consumption trends. For once, it accelerated pivot towards digital. So um, if um, we had in the past, the post 19s and post 80s generation of millennial consumers shopping online for imported food and drinks, pandemic um, widened that pool of customers. So these now include not only um, other age categories like elderly, um, and um, families with children, but also includes um, consumers that live um, away from the big metropolitan cities like Shanghai and Beijing. Those consumers are at a um, earlier stage of embracing uh, foreign food and drink products, but they're discovering those through um, e-commerce. Um, another very strong um, consumer trend was uh, the um, embracing of health food and um, products that um, 
are perceived as boosting immunity, given that the origin of all of these viruses, like SARS, like um, coronavirus, was zoonotic diseases. Consumer have taken in China have taken a very um, um, hard look at um, the meat-based products that consume at the moment, and have pivoted towards plant-based products. Um, they have increased their consumption of dietary suppl supplements, um, and they have also um, um, boosted their intake of dairy products. To note that China is nowhere comparable to other markets in dairy consumption, but um, the central government has been driving a very successful com education campaign um, to increase awareness of the um, benefits of dairy consumption and during COVID that um, actually had um, some positive um, impact on, um, on the sales of these products. Chinese consumers now believe that dairy products boost immunity. So anything with immunity boosting properties, whether in terms of drinks, fusion products or dairy has done really, really well um, in the market. Um, since COVID. Next slide, please. Um, today we are, um, you know, for the purpose of this webinar, focusing on the uh, cross-border e-commerce um, route to market. And you will hear from um, a number of our member companies like Elanders and Regroup on the benefits of um, using this channel, but here for um, a wider awareness, I have illustrated what it a normal um, company route to market look at the moment. Some of the route to market you would recognize, they are comparable to what brands take um, in other markets. Um, others are unique. The cross-border e-commerce platform route is unique to China. So this involves the selling of um, food and drink products um, across authorized um, e-commerce platforms across national borders. And that means that there is less scrutiny of um, adherence to food safety um, standards, um, less need for those products to be um, compliant um, with the whole food safety network that um, China has in place, which is extremely um, elaborate. And really the opportunity for um, SMEs now to sell directly um, B2C to Chinese consumers or B2B to see uh, from, um, from, the, from the UK. Um, this would require um, engagement with a TP, which is a third party or a trade partner in order to set up the platform, which um, uh, in this case has been taken care by Business West. Next slide, please. Um, you probably can't see that in a greater detail, but essentially the longer chain at the top illustrates the standard um, UK brands to retail and consumer market journey and all of the different links of the chain a product needs to go through from product registration, input permit, going through customs, reaching the distributor, the sub-distributor, and finally um, finding the Chinese consumers. Cross-border e-commerce cycle um, shortens that um, and offers indeed um, a quicker um, route to market for um, UK food and drink brands. Next slide, please. It is worth noting that um, what's imported through cross-border e-commerce platforms is governed by a positive list, which tends to change every year. Over the last two to three years, we've seen its um, constant update and enlargement, to be um, fair. It always happens around Christmas. So we go on Christmas holiday and wake up to the news that the, the positive list for cross-border has been expanded. Um, this has been uh, the most recent uh, um, expansion included um, actually some spirits, which is a really um, positive step forward um, in order the, uh, for the um, pool of products that could be exported through um, cross-border e-commerce. Um, there is also a snapshot of the main, uh, main cross-border e-commerce platforms. Um, this may have changed in terms of market share um, um, during COVID, so we will have the um, um, latest figures, I suppose, early next year. Next slide, please. 
Um, so I think um, cross border is really what um, we um, are here. We are talking about today, and it is indeed on a day, Singles Day or Double Eleven, the 11th of November, when China is all in the midst of the biggest online shopping festival in the world biggest than Black Friday, biggest than Amazon's um, sales extravaganza. We don't have the figures that will emerge um, from that um, festival just yet, but just to um, mention that last year during 24 hours, Alibaba's platforms realized more than 30 billion um, US, I'm um, sorry, um, 30 billion sterling um, sales and um, that is um, something um, that China, the cross-border e-commerce channel um, is claiming a bigger share of this year, more and more so. Next slide, please. So who are your target consumers? Um, obviously, we are targeting the Chinese millennial, the Generation Z, and you would see that the top spending markets for both post-80s and post-90s Chinese uh, millennials are all on food and drink, followed by clothes and digital products and entertainment. These are consumers that are educated, Western culture and savvy. A lot of them have traveled, have been educated um, in the West. They are born with mobile and um, they appreciate um, the provenance, the heritage, the artisan credentials that come associated with uh, British food and drink products. Next slide, please. Uh, we will hear more about WeChat um, uh, from the other speakers, uh, but just to highlight that 900 million users of Chinese consumers um, have access to internet. I think now the number it's, uh, well, how many of those are probably 600 million are um, using WeChat and um, mobile, um, consumption and mobile payment are the default modes of consumption for the majority of these consumers. Next slide. So WeChat, uh, I think there are the qualified speakers to introduce that in full, but because today is Singles Day and because a lot of that will be um, linked to online sales, I just wanted to highlight that WeChat has of recent become one of the preferred um, channels for entertainment and for live streaming e-commerce sales. So that means that once the um, GBBF WeChat store is up and running, um, um, the brands would be able to engage with similar activities which are essentially by a uh, see now, buy now, uh, propelled by key opinion leaders or internet celebrities with millions of followers. Next slide. Um, just um, before I wrap up today, uh, this is in no way um, all China conclusive presentation, but just wanted to highlight that for those of you engaging with this program, the um, opportunities that we offer at the moment um, that are relevant for other routes to market, including uh, a virtual new to China product assessment focus group if you were looking to launch products offline, as well as a virtual meet buyer if you wanted to reach out to um, distributors and offline partners. We have also hosted two UK Super Brand Day, which are um, live streaming e commerce um, sales day for brands that already have online presence in the market. So, very soon brands on the WeChat store of GBBF program will be able to access that as well, as well as hosted an offline and online gene festival um, for some of our um, clients. Next slide, please. Um, and conscious that you may need um, many of your um, questions on creating and putting together a China strategy in place answered, I wanted to highlight that we are launching today as well a China Chat online consumer series for UK brands, where we aim to um, discuss um, all of your China queries. So the first session kicks off this afternoon at 2.30. Uh, you're all very welcome to join. Details for that are on our website. And now I will hand back to um, the events team. And thank you very much indeed for your attention. 
Thank you very much for that, Antoinette. Um, I would now like to introduce the Managing Director of Regroup Media, Scott Muir, who will be telling us about the benefits of marketing and about the build of the online store of WeChat. Over to you, Scott. Thanks very much. Um, great. Well, uh, just before I talk a little bit about um, uh, WeChat side of things in more depth and the, the mini program, uh, the shop front on WeChat, um, I'll tell you a little bit about myself and, and, uh, and Regroup. Uh, uh, I'll run through these slides. So um, Regroup China, uh, are, we are a digital marketing agency dedicated to helping uh, brands in the UK market to China via online platforms. So we have a head office in London. We also have offices in uh, Shanghai and Guangzhou and my colleague, uh, uh, Kun Tang is also on this uh, call from uh, um, Guangzhou right now. So we um, handhold the UK uh, 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 retail trade and, uh, and brands, uh, but also in the B2B and education space uh, to reach their audience in China. Uh, next slide, please. Just a quick uh, run through of some of the services that we offer as a digital agency. We help uh, companies uh, define the strategy for China. It's obviously a very confusing uh, landscape, uh, all the digital, key digital channels in China being different to the channels that we're familiar with over here. So we uh, provide a service to help our clients understand the size of their market online and uh, what the competitor landscape looks like and how to reach that audience. We're involved in building up um, uh, brand awareness, achieving fame through the key social media channels in China. So. Uh, we, we'll talk obviously more about WeChat, but Weibo, Little Red Book, um, and a plethora of other social channels. Um, we're involved in helping brands building their sales online through partly WeChat, as we'll come to talk about more, but also Tmall, uh, JD. We're also involved in search marketing on Baidu to reach, uh, uh, to generate uh, uh, traffic and sales to, to websites. We design Chinese websites for brands over here. And finally, we also help brands uh, protect their reputation online in China. Next slide, please. So we're here to talk about uh, WeChat. Uh, we've got a, a little bit of information on uh, some background stats for those who might not be so familiar with WeChat. Next slide, please. So before I jump into talking about WeChat, uh, I, I want to take a step back and explain our role and, and, and where we're at with the process. So uh, Regroup have um, uh, um, set up a WeChat account for the Great British Food Program. We have uh, uh, also set up a mini program, which is essentially the shop front for this initiative. We're also involved in uh, generating content for this uh, program. So we'll talk a little bit about the, the protocol of, of, of content. It's not like Twitter, where maybe you're doing short form posts. This is far more engaged content, typically long form posts, uh, more akin to blogs. And uh, we um, got an example, actually, I think on one of the following slides. So it's, it's, it's uh, far more engaging content. And, and as, as a result, it's a fantastic channel to build the backstory for, for, for each brand. So we're involved in that side of things as well, as well as the advertising. So we'll talk a little bit about how we're going to reach our audience in China through the WeChat advertising platform. So that's um, that's uh, our involvement in in the, the um, on, on the WeChat side of things. Um, a little bit of information on WeChat itself. It's uh, the, the very basic pointers here, but what you need to know about WeChat is it's huge. Uh, over a billion people now using WeChat. If you consider it as a social media channel, which in strictly speaking, it's not, it's many things. Social media is one of those things. But if we consider it a social media channel, it would be the fifth biggest in the world, but it is a growing channel. It's actually still relatively uh, young and a lot of the features within WeChat, like the advertising platform and the technology behind the store, the mini program, they're all relatively young as well. So things are changing at a pace and opening up new opportunities. Um, consider WeChat less a social channel, though, more as a digital ecosystem. And this is how Tencent, the owners of WeChat, describe WeChat themselves. 
Um, our office in Guangzhou is quite close to the tents and HQ, so we we know how they describe themselves, and that is how they would uh, describe WeChat itself as a as an ecosystem. But as we can see on this graphic. There's many things that come under that ecosystem. Social media is one, e-commerce is another, uh, payment gateway, WeChat Pay. Um, these are the elements that uh, go into the Great British Food Programme, WeChat Presence. But there's also areas uh, around um, messaging, call facility is a gaming platform. There's an Instagram type functionality within WeChat. It can also be used as a booking engine. So there's, there's many things and really WeChat's vision or Tencent's vision for WeChat is Chinese uh, users of which there are very many don't need to leave WeChat. So you wake up in the morning and do your social media, your messaging, your calls, you book a taxi, you pay your utility bills, except can all be done within this ecosystem. So it's we have a captive and huge audience to reach. That's why we would consider WeChat uh, an absolute priority channel for Western brands when we're helping prove the concept. Uh, next slide, please. So here we have an example on the right hand side of a, a post, a typical post. So I mentioned part of what Regroup are doing here is, is, is put, um, uh, uh, writing and posting content on a regular basis on WeChat for the uh, Great British Food Programme. So you can see it's quite long form uh, content. Uh, we can also use video, we can use infographic type content there. It, as I mentioned at the start, it's very much the ideal platform to explore the story of a brand. Um, really uh, drilling into the history of the brand and what, 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 what it's all about. Um, but there's many other things that we plan to talk about on WeChat as part, under the, the banner of uh, Great British Food Programme. Seasonality is one of those very hot areas, obviously Singles Day is today, um, but we also have the 12th of December, which is a big sales date in the diary um, in a month's time. Then we have Christmas, which is becoming bigger in China. We also have Chinese New Year at the beginning of February. So there's a lot of seasonality content that we plan to push through this channel. We plan to push the messaging around British made, which is a positive. Um, most of our clients are from the UK and we're very used to promoting that Britishness. We have some clients in Germany and we do something very similar there as well. But, but um, that stamp of being from the UK is, is a positive and, and me the messaging needs to be pushed um, out there. Um, we plan to do lifestyle posts. We need to do, to do content and general topics. We've already done a post, I think, on farmers markets in the UK, for instance. So we want to educate the market. But typically, we'll be doing these posts only four times a month. So it's, again, it's not like Twitter, where you're doing a tweet every day. These are more informed uh, posts that, that are done less frequently. Next slide, please. So that's the content side, that, that being a key area to build up the story and, and reach our market. The next area is the um, e-commerce piece, the mini program technology. So next slide, please. Uh, mini programs are essentially apps within an app. So uh, WeChat itself is an app. A mini program is an app within the WeChat ecosystem. Um, they're hosted on Tencent servers, so typically are pretty fast to perform uh, in terms of performance. Um, and, and we can also link um, a, a mini program in an e-commerce ca uh, capacity to WeChat Pay. So again, go back to that point that the user never has to leave WeChat in that whole process. So the mini program we're talking about here is an e-commerce mini program. Uh, if we go to the next slide, please. And we can see uh, um, uh, a screen, a couple of screen grabs of how the mini program looks. So this is up there now. It's it's uh, it's been designed, as we can see on the left hand uh, screen grab. You have the categories um, uh, uh, at the top. So baby, drink, dairy, alcohol, for instance, we have a hero banner at the very top, which would uh, showcase different brands at different times. We um, are then able to focus content around bestsellers, for instance, or new promotions. And then the user simply clicks on the product and then goes into the product page and then purchases the product through their WeChat Pay. Their money uh, goes from WeChat Pay into our WeChat Pay account. And that is as simple as the, the process is really. It's, it's e-commerce on a mobile phone. Um, so that's the, the, the 
the status of the mini program. Um, we uh, have it designed and ready to um, upload uh, data feeds. Um, uh, if we go to the next slide, please. We can see another example of one that we've done fairly recently. Uh, this is one that we've done uh, for a mini program in the food and drink space for a brand called Bunting in Germany who owns supermarkets. Um, this has just gone live. And the reason I wanted to talk about this is it's clearly indicative of there being a bit of a groundswell and in interest, um, particularly in the food and drink space, um, that these the, that the brands now are, are considering WeChat as a, as a vehicle to reaching their market um, and, and generating sales. Next slide. So we've talked about content and how we post content and the length of content. We've talked about the mini program shop front. Uh, we've seen what it looks like. Uh, we've seen uh, how, how people engage. Um, the final component is uh, that's all well and good, but how do we reach our audience through WeChat? And uh, WeChat, and there are a number of ways that so us regroup as a marketing agency can promote WeChat. One is through the WeChat advertising platform, where we can target people based on age, gender, location, interests, and search behavior. Um, the next slide, please. The final area is through uh, key opinion leaders who essentially are social media influencers, some of whom may have a number of million people following them on WeChat or Weibo. We can tap into the, 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 the foodie KOLs or the, the well-being KOLs to reach a potentially enormous audience. And these are the ways that we plan to promote the account. Next slide. That's a, a, a run through um, and uh, I'm, sure, I'm sure that you'll need some further information and I'll be more than happy to answer questions at the end. Thank you very much. Thank you for that, Scott. We're now going to talk about the logistics, documentation and consolidation with Kevin Rogers, the Managing Director, and Gavin Rothfuse, the Supply Chain Project Manager of Elanders Group. Over to you. Thanks, Mark, and good afternoon, everybody. Um, can I start by saying that Elanders are very happy to be part of the partnership, which, which by design makes it simple for UK producers to reach Chinese consumers. I think Business West have done a fantastic job to create a program with experienced partners to access one of the most exciting and largest markets in the world. So if I can start with uh, giving an introduction to Landers, we will be responsible for all logistics, including warehousing and distribution in China, providing support for related documentation and consolidating goods in the UK ready for shipping. So these are the topics we, myself and my colleague Gavin Rothfuse, uh, will be covering during the, this part of the presentation. So who are Landers? We're a Swedish-owned global business. We're operating in 20 different countries, two of which are the UK and China. We turn over 1.1 billion euros globally. We've got approximately 90 facilities worldwide. Uh, we've got 1 million square meters of warehouse and production space, and we employ approximately 7,000 employees. Next slide, please. This is a snapshot of our global footprint. We cover Asia, Europe, and Americas. I'm sharing this information really just to give Elanda some credibility and the, the producers some reassurance that we're proven supply chain experts, so your products are safe in our hands. Um, next slide. So this uh, graphic illustrates what Elanders do. Uh, many famous brands trust Elanders to manage their end-to-end -end supply chains. So we take responsibility for moving goods from point of origin, transporting all over the world, and providing services for customs clearance, warehousing activities, labels and packaging, outbound logistics, e-fulfillment for e-commerce, and also managing any returns. So at this point, I'll hand over to my colleague, Gavin, who will explain in, in detail. So next slide, exactly what services the landers will be covering. Thanks, Kevin, and good afternoon, everyone. So as you've probably gathered from some of the previous information, there, there is traditionally a lot of stigma into the entry into the Chinese market for, for certain products or products from certain regions. Obviously, one of those, it, a big part of, of that or 
part of that stigma is is relatively justified and it centers around the logistics and actually getting product into the market so the solution we've we've put together aims to remove that and and sort of put as little burden on the producers as possible in, in getting product over to to china itself so Part of that, what does that entail? That it, as, as Kevin mentioned, it's a full end-to-end -end supply chain service. So if we start from the beginning, um, that includes uh, collection from producer sites through a round robin collection, whether that's, that's a weekly, bi-weekly, a monthly collection, depending on, on the product or, or the availability. Um, for alcoholic products, that'll include movement guarantees from the producer to a consolidation warehouse. Um, in terms of storage in the UK, your product will be stored in a in a facility in Milton Keynes, which which as it stands is under bond. So, again, what that means is that is a duty suspended warehouse. Um, I'll, I'll touch on that point a bit later on in the process. Um, after consolidation in the warehouse, there will be biweekly or monthly shipments. Again, depending on volumes and availability of product. And that will include freight into China itself, uh, predominantly sea freight, um, obviously to keep costs as, as reasonable as possible. For certain products, it may be that air freight is required to get it to get there quicker if it is perishable or if there's a shorter ex expiry date range on, on those products. Um, once it, once it arrives in China, um, it will be stored in our Chinese facility as well in the free trade zone in Shanghai. Again, this is a, a facility that is under bond, so again, duty suspended. Now, just on that point specifically, what that does mean is as, as a producer, um, you, you wouldn't need to pay import duties into China on the bulk shipment when that part product arrives at port. So provided we have all the correct information from in the beginning when, when products are made available before collection, um, which I'll touch on in the next slide, is that cargo will move smoothly through through port and through customs facilities into the storage facility as well. Um, at no point will you be required to pay duty on those products. However, when the when when the product is sold to the end customer, it's at that point you'll pay duty. So, what we're doing with that is we're shifting um, your the 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 duty burden on, on cash flow from a bulk payment up front with the uncertainty of when product would sell to the point of sale for a customer. So only once that product is sold will you pay duty on that product. Um, the last piece of that supply chain includes last mile delivery in China, which we make use of uh, local carrier networks within the region, and they are specialist, specialists within um, the specific territories within China as well. Next slide, please. So what are the benefits? Um, I've touched on a few points, but just briefly, um, obviously the admin overheads in terms of logistics for import and export um, sort of sits with the logistics provider, which in this case would be landers ourselves. Um, the aim again is to take as much of the burden away from the producers as possible and allow you to focus on production of your product and, and, and sales. Um, the logistics itself, again, as, as Kevin mentioned previously, is handled by ourselves as a single partner, and that will include everything from, from collection at source through to final mile delivery. So at no point will, it, will that cargo or the responsibility of that cargo leave um, the hands of Elanders. The cargo will ship under bond again, which I've, which I've touched on brief, brief, briefly. So there's a, a cash flow benefit in terms of duty payments into China, as well as um, eliminating any risks of delays at the border or getting product into market. Um, the storage area itself within the free trade zone, again, is dedicated to this specific project. And what we'll do is towards the end of this, there's, there's a couple of um, images, again, just to reassure everyone that, that the infrastructure is available it does exist and it is it is specific for this project as well next slide please so as part of the sign up uh, process uh, there's there is some some information that's needed to enable the smooth flow of logistics um, and that mainly revolves around product information so and this is a this is a once-off per product or per per selling unit or SKU 
And what it is, by capturing this information up front, we will provide it to Chinese customs. Um, it gets registered with Chinese customs themselves as well, and it pre-alerts them to say that this cargo is is going to arrive within the next few weeks into into the region. Now, what that does is that that allows um, the the Chinese customs authorities to to preempt any any potential checks that may be needed. It allows them to flag any potential issues or restricted products before the products are, e are even collected from the producers. Um, so some of that information which required is the standard product information in terms of SKUs, part numbers, descriptions, um, HS codes, which is the export commodity codes. Um, a key part of this is a full list of ingredients. And again, that, that is, some of it may seem excessive, but unfortunately, these, these are some of the, ba the barriers to the Chinese market. And by providing this information up front, it allows the free flow of goods into, into the territory. Um, the, the rest of the information, again, is pretty standard in terms of expiry dates, carts and dimensions, country of origin, um, and, and so forth. Next slide, please. Um, a key part of information to note on this particular slide is an ARC number, which is a, an administrative reference code specifically for alcoholic products. So um, there was a question from, from a gin producer or, or whiskies or whatever. The, um, the ARC number is unique reference per consignment. And again, that's just that's, that's required for UK customs as well as for Chinese customs as well. So once again, by providing this information up front before collection takes place or product registration or brand sign up, um, it does allow smooth flow of product into China. Next slide, please. Just an overview of the consolidation, um, how it works is, is very briefly, as I explained earlier, um, we will collect from, from each site that will be stored in our Milton Keynes facility um, here in the UK. Um, palletized for LCL shipment. So that's that's a, a less than container shipment. Again, this is volume dependent and product availability. It, it may end up being a, a dedicated full container for a mix of, of products or brands. Um, that will be shipped directly into the free trade zone in China. Um, at the moment, fortnightly or, or monthly. Um, and the Elanders group ourselves will manage the, the full movement of that cargo. Throughout the process, there's, you know, there, there are um, points where we'll provide information back to producers in terms of vis visibility of your cargo or your inventory, either whether it's a receipt into the UK warehouse, once it's ready to ship, um, receipt into the Chinese warehouse, inventory holding in China, and any shipment um, related information out of the Chinese warehouse as well to end customers. Next slide, please. So as I mentioned earlier, um, this is the, the facility in the free trade zone in, in China or segment of that facility. Um, as it's under bond, there are, there are strict security and surveillance um, measures in place as well. So full CCT coverage, um, restricted access to the site as well. Um, and as I mentioned previously, dedicated storage for your products, including pick and pack areas as well. Next slide, please. So thanks, Gavin. Thank you. I'll just do a, just do a quick summary. Um, so Rolanders are responsible for all logistics documentation and consolidation as Gavin covered the, the specific details there. And we can offer you peace of mind because your products will be managed by the Rolanders team at every step. And as you can see from the, uh, even the warehouse images, we're all set up, ready to go. And we can support producers with any supply chain related queries or uh, documentation which are required to support the program. I think on the next slide, we've got our contact details should anybody want to reach out to us uh, directly. So I'm sure uh, Business West can manage that too. Thanks, Mark. Kevin and Gavin, thank you for all of this information. I'd now like to introduce Graham McCallum, who is NJ Acre & Co Limited's trademark attorney, who will be advising us on IP and legislation. Over to you, Graham. Thanks, Mark, for that introduction. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, so what we want to cover in this is um, 
protection of your IP, in particular your brand in China. NJ Acres are a firm of patent and trademark attorneys and we're qualified to practice in Europe and the UK and we represent clients um, throughout the Southwest and we're based in the Southwest. We specialize in advising clients on their IP um, in it, uh, sorry the slides changed unexpectedly there. Um, we specialize in advising clients on um, how to identify the IP in their business, then obtaining their IP protection, and then subsequently enforcement if this becomes necessary. In addition to domestic clients in the Southwest and other parts of the UK, we also represent multinational corporations based overseas who wish to protect their IP in the UK and Europe. We have a particularly strong expertise in China where we regularly um, excuse me, where we're regularly filing for protection in China, particularly on the brand side, but also patents and designs as well. And then we've been involved quite strongly in contentious matters in China as well. Um, so, for example, we've been involved in bad faith and cancellation actions, which we have about approximately 60% success rate, and we're currently in the process of filing um, an appeal to the Chinese Supreme Court on one particular matter. In this presentation, uh, we don't have much time, so want to focus primarily on trademarks and also mention to a lesser extent confidential information for just to be clear about what we are talking about when we're talking about IP assets, we're primarily talking about trademarks or brands, designs, patents, copyright, and confidential information. Next slide. So focusing first on trademarks, China is very much a first to file country. So it's extremely important that you get your trademark application on file as soon as possible in China. Um, and this is much more important than it is in the UK and Europe where there are specific rights if you've been using the mark for a number of years and not registered it. In China, you tend not to have these rights. This means that it can be difficult and expensive to try and, um, try and get your Mac mark back if you do not file it first. So the basic advice and the take home, one of the take home messages on this presentation is really to file as early as possible and preferably before you enter the Chinese market. Confidential information may also come up with, um, especially in discussions with partners and prospective partners. Um, confidential information typically covers trade secrets and know-hows and we'd recommend all clients use written NDAs um, when discussing um, uh, prospective agreements with Chinese partners and with written with an NDA you want to ensure that that is signed before um, before you um, start the discussions. Uh, next slide. So briefly want to cover some of the IP risks that you may come across in China and there are a number of risks um, examples of which are listed here maybe risks associated with having or not having a Chinese product name um, there may be issues where your Chinese agent or distributor offers to register your trademark for you in China there may be issues in manufacturing in China and also trade fairs in China but for the purposes of this presentation, I would like to focus just on the first two aspects. Next slide, please. So you're going into China, do you have a Chinese brand name? And by Chinese brand name, I mean, do you have a, a mark that is in Chinese script? If you don't, there are potential risks. There may be that other companies registers a Chinese brand name, perhaps um, a mark in Chinese that is phonetically similar to your mark and for the same goods. Um, could be that the brand name is developed by a Chinese agent or retailer and that you don't consider it suitable, or it could be that a brand name is invented by Chinese consumers and you may feel that that brand name is not is not a mark that you are comfortable with. It's maybe a mark that you don't feel reflects your um, your company culture, or it may be a brand name that has perhaps um, perhaps unintended, perhaps intended, perhaps has a has a meaning that um, 
that is perhaps not complementary to your product. Next slide. Um, other IP risks is your Chinese agent or distributor offers to register your trademark for you in China. Admittedly, this does have advantages. The agent says they will take care of it for you and perhaps the agent will pay for it as well. Um, so overall, this might seem like it's less hassle than they pay. So it all sounds great. And next slide, or is it? A few years later, if you part company with your agent, the trademark is then registered in the agent's name, not your name. And this means that they own the trademark rights in China, not you. And so potentially if you then split with that agent for whatever reason, the agent can stop you using your trademark in China. And this can be a problem as well if you have appointed an agent for a particular area of China, and then you want to appoint another agent in another part of China. It may be that that, trademark, the trademark registration that your agent, your first agent has registered will prevent you appointing a second agent in a different part of China. Um, so that's something to, we certainly recommend is that all clients hold the, all the IP rights in their UK company name um, and not in a joint venture or an agent's name where possible. Next slide. Um, so overall, just finally looking at IP strategy and points you should be considering in China. I think the most important thing is to start early and plan ahead. Think about where you'll be in a few years time when you're going into China. Protect your brand before you enter into the China market. Understand your IP assets and risks and speak to your IP advisor if necessary to find out what your IP assets are if you're not sure. Um, Think about can you afford not to own or use your IP in China, particularly your brand name, and consider what your competitors may want to do, what your competitors may want to copy, and what your competitors may think are valuable assets. Um, and really, a lot of that can be summed up in just basically doing your due diligence and minimizing risk before you go into China. And above all, lastly, um, there's lots of other people out there who've had experience for many years exporting to China and talk to them. A lot of them have great advice for you and you maybe learn and prevent you making maybe mistakes that others have made. Okay, and that um, wraps it up. This is a very quick um, summary of IP and brands and protection in China. And if you want further advice, by all means, reach out to me and contact me separately. Thanks. Thank you very much for that, Graham. I'd now like to introduce Jim Hodgson, who is a project and implementation manager for Business West, to explain about the application process. Over to you, Jim. Thank you, Mark. Uh, could you just enable me to start my video, please? There we go. Thanks very much. Can you just confirm you can see and hear me? I can confirm. Thanks. Uh, thank you, Mark. And thank you also to all the speakers who have uh, contributed to date. Um, I think this really clearly articulates the various different components of our offering here at Business West from the importance of intellectual property and protecting your marks in the China marketplace right through to understanding the mechanics of uh, influencer marketing through WeChat. And it's very clear that to use James's language from earlier that what we have here is a complete solution for food and drink brands seeking to dip their toes into the Chinese marketplace. Now, uh, my name is Jim Hodgson. I've been working uh, at, at Business West for three years now, uh, and I, I work in project management and do a lot of work with the food and drink team. I know that many of you on this call today will be chomping at the bit to be part of this first cohort of this project. And in this next section, I'm going to basically help break down the next steps, step by step, to, uh, to enable you to understand how to be part of this fantastic initiative. Before I do that, I would like to share a couple of reflections so far. From listening to the speakers today, it's very clear that as we bring all of these various different strands of the project together, um, this is a very, uh, this is a phenomenal uh, prospect for food and drink companies in the UK. Now, as many of you on the call will be aware, there are other cross-border e-commerce opportunities out there. But if I may say so myself, none of them are quite as compelling as the solution that we have brought to the table today. Um, because the, for the first cohort of companies that are lucky enough to be part of this project, the shipping, the customs, the logistics, the marketing, 
that will all be free as part of the first cohort and all we ask in return is for you to uh, to arrange your intellectual property protection and then a seven percent uh, commission on the sale price of any goods sold now knowing that the next best competitor in the market has a similar model but with 25 percent commission um, that should hopefully op uh, offer a great deal of confidence in the model that we've put together and exactly what we're doing here at Business West. And I think this is a timely point to remind everyone on the call that Business West is a not-for-profit company. So we've invested a great deal of time and money into this. And thank you for everyone who's been part of that. You know who you are uh, to make this a success. And we've made that investment because we're passionate about export. It's very much part of our DNA and we understand the benefits that it can bring. Now, I'm conscious that for many of you on this call, 2020 has been a really difficult year uh, for a number of different reasons. And for a number of uh, exporting companies on the call, um, exporting has been met with challenges. OK, so I do want to take this opportunity to refresh collective confidence in exporting. Um, it really can be a route to supercharging your company, to providing long term sustainable growth for your brand and of course, increased resilience of your organization compared to your non-exporting counterparts. So I've talked about how passionate we are about this stuff at Business West, and we know that because it offers win-wins. It offers growth for companies, it offers more choice for consumers and brand recognition abroad, and crucially, it offers this boost to cooperation and openness across borders. And if I may uh, have just place a gen gentle nod to the US election result last week, I think this is really important that after a period of protectionism in international trade, um, this project couldn't be better timed because I think we're at the, uh, the dawn of a new era insofar as openness and cooperation across borders is concerned. So in the spirit of these values and shared vision, we do invite you to be part of this and we want food and drink companies to come on this journey with us. Uh, next slide, please, Jenny. Okay, so we've put this slide together for you today. Um, to help communicate simply what happens and when. The whole process rolls from left to right. And as you can see, there's these swim lanes that are running um, horizontally, which denote the various responsibilities in the process. And I think tools like this are really important, particularly in an age where we can't be in the same room due to COVID. And I would hate for any company on the call today to miss out on this great opportunity owing to lack of clarity. So we have produced this for you. The slide uh, number on the deck is number 65 and you will get a copy of the slides afterwards. So please use this as your as your map. So if you are interested in being part of this first cohort, you must, must, must send us your expression of interest by 5 p.m. Monday, the 16th of November. Etch that in your diaries. Um, the next step after that is that we are going to select the successful companies by uh, the end or close of play the day after. OK, so we'll be looking at things like exportability of the product and various other um, uh, factors to determine which companies we bring on board. The next bit is um, important. Uh, it is the signing of contracts. Okay, so this basically involves signing a contract with Business West and also signing a contract with Regroup Media. Um, in an age of digitalization, you'll be pleased to know you don't need pen or paper to do this. We've got a system called DocuSign and my colleague Lucy will be ably uh, arranging for those to be signed and um, please do them quickly it please do read the contracts but it only takes a, a couple of clicks once you're happy with the terms now very simply the business west contract that you will sign sets out the responsibilities of each party in relation to the project namely business west we own the wechat store in china for the great british food store we will take care of your logistics your consolidation and your payments via elanders for that first cohort you as the food and drink producer take care of your intellectual property and agree the commission rate of 7%. And it's the same deal for the, uh, the agreement with Regroup. You're basically giving them permission to market on your behalf and drive traffic to the store through influencer marketing that we've heard about earlier from Scott. And they've got a great deal of experience in doing this successfully for British brands to date. So you know you're in safe hands with Regroup. After we've signed the contracts, there's then a process of, of uh, completing the onboarding form. Um, I'm going to uh, put together a video explaining how this works by the end of this week. So successful companies who've been selected by the 17th will receive that. Um, it's in two stages. You upload your uh, basic details around the company and then you upload your, uh, your, your products step by step. Now, just to stress, you must have stock set aside for this project. So we're inviting companies to set aside up to a pallet of their 
products. Uh, we recognize that for some companies, you might want to go into half pallets. We will, of course, negotiate with you uh, as part of the, uh, the process. And we're generally limiting it to about five products per company, five SKUs per company. Um, now, the reason that these dates are in place, they are fixed. There's very little flexibility on these dates at all. So this is really important. Please use this as your guide, is that we have our eyes on the prize, which you can see on the right hand of the swim lanes is Chinese New Year. Now, this is a huge opportunity for e-commerce, uh, particularly for categories of goods like uh, luxury goods, groceries and gifts. And from a recent survey that I was reading this morning, 62 percent of Chinese nationals are now shopping for food and drink more online since the pandemic. So these opportunities, the phenomenon of the uh, Chinese New Year in the Chinese calendar, plus the explosive growth of e-commerce, you put these two things together and we know that this is a great time to launch. So that's why the deadlines are very, uh, very tight. As I say, this is um, slide number 65 on the deck that you're going to receive. Uh, thank you for listening. Thank you. Over to Mark. Thank you for that clarity, Jim. I'm now happy to introduce the Initiative Lead and Business West International Delivery Manager, Paul Abley, for our Q&A session today. If you do have any questions, please type them into the Q&A tab for Paul and the panellists to answer. Over to you, Paul. Thank you, thank you Mark. Um, firstly, I'd like, I really would like to thank all, all of the panellists um, today. Um, you, we, we understand the, the, the solution that we're trying, we've pulled together and the service we're, we're looking to offer now is one that it's no, it's no small task. Um, as James alluded to at the beginning of the presentation, so this is something that we've been looking at now for two to two and a half years. We've gone down several rabbit holes um, and and spoken to many organisations, some of them we were talking to, we were talking over over a quarter of a million pounds to set a single storefront up. Um, you know, what we've done now is, I think we've certainly, we've gone out over the last two years, we've learned a lot. We've identified the right partners that can help us deliver to, to the food and drink producers a full one-stop shop online um, solution so again thank you to all the panelists uh bringing their expertise and um, look forward to working with you soon one um one thing i would say is you know, we have um we we've seen the great british food program it's grown it, you know it was a southwest platform that platform now is being used by you know it, the English food and drinks, Scottish, Welsh and Northern Irish food and drink companies. So whilst you know, the, the backer of this platform is Business West and we are, you know, we service the Southwest for the DIT contracts, this is very much an offering at a national level. So you, we've already got companies signed up from outside of the region um, and we're happy to support others as well. So really pleased to, to look and see what we can do there. Um, I'm going to have a look at the questions, see what questions we've got. Uh, one of them we have already is a regarding the SKUs and the limiting of products. You know, I think what, we, what we've, um, we've identified, and this was through talking with the guys at Regroup as well, that what we need to do, we, it, we can't just generate one store and, and fill it with a brand if we do that we're not going to drive the traffic that we want to dr drive to the store you know, the idea of being stronger together and the supermarket being able to give that that opportunity of the variety of choice and opening cross-selling is what we're hoping to achieve here so we are limiting at this stage five SKUs um, but what I would do just to on a technical side, I, um, potentially ask Scott maybe if Scott, if you can just reiterate why uh, we chat, why we're limiting the number of products and the, the technical reasons for that. Uh, yes, thanks, Paul. Um, I think the key thing here is obviously this is a, a shared shop for multiple brands and. Uh, 
Um, and, and that whole uh, theme of proof of concept is really important. So I think it's uh, really showcasing the you know, best of breed products. It's, um, I guess it goes back to the 80 20 rule. We don't want to crowd the shop with thousands of SKUs and, um, uh, and, and confuse the kind of interface. Um, it, it's very much keeping it focused um, and um, and, and hopefully that's possible with with m most of the brands that that, that come on board. Um, you know, uh, we, we we can be flexible in terms of that 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 rule. I'm sure if needs be, but uh, I think in most instances um, it makes sense. I think to lead with um, best sellers and um, products that are kind of more aligned to the Chinese market, perhaps. Thank you, Scott. Uh Another one it's in the chat is around IP registration, the, the time frames and usual costs. Uh, Graham, would you like to take that one for us? So what, what, are the, what sort of timelines would we be able to do that for us now? All right, thanks, Paul. Sorry about that. I was on. I didn't realise I was still on mute. Um, yeah, I just saw that question. Um, in terms of the process of getting the application on file, which is the most important thing, that can be done. It can be done within a few days and certainly within a week. Um, what we tend to find is the delay is normally at the client's end deciding on how they wish to proceed, perhaps the marks they wish to file or the goods or services that they wish to cover. Um, in this instance, where we've got food and drink, it should normally be fairly clear um, and should be possible to, um, to basically identify that very quickly. Um, so and normally we've filed a couple of Chinese new applications last week and right from instructions to filing were typically about three or four days. Um, but obviously we need to do some um, checks, internal stuff that we're required to do by our professional regulator, um, including conflict checks and actually formally onboarding the client. And that is probably another day or so to do. Um, but it, yes, in principle, it can be done quite quickly. If I can just add there, actually, it's <laughs> worth everyone on the call uh, recognising that the Great British Food Store, we have been through this process uh, with Graham. I think he's slightly underselling the process there. He's yeah, very efficient. It all happened during lockdown. We never needed to be in the in, in the same room. And uh, it's a very swift process indeed. So I'm, uh, whoever raised that question, absolutely right to do that. Um, but we're very confident that we can get that filing in place prior to product launch, which will be absolutely crucial. Thanks, Jim. And I think the other important point to mention on that is that what's really important is getting the filing date rather than the registration certificate because the filing date is what basically plants your flag in the sand and says i own this ip or i own this mark in china as of that date so anyone that comes along after the filing date and tries to register the same mark will be effectively preempted by your earlier application Um, so I'm just scrolling through the questions. So we have one here around the financial support and logistics. So once once the support ends, what what are the the costs moving forward for transport, warehousing, final mile delivery? I think what we would say there is, you know, we do have a, a rate card. Obviously, that is changing um, week by week, day by day. What we can do, maybe uh, Gavin, if you can just explain how those costs are, are built in and what what people are likely to, to um, have to have to be aware of. Sure, no problem. So, in, in terms of in terms of transport, um, as Paul mentioned, that is that is variable depending on the freight market at, at the point of time or the point of shipment. So. To give you ballpark figures, I mean, to, to ship a full container in, into China, a 20-foot container can be anything in the region of anything between $900 to $1,500 per container. Um, that's obviously dependent on the mix of products included in the shipment. It's it, it depends on the, um, on the shipping lines or, or any market conditions that prevail at, at the time of shipment. 
if it's anything less, so if it's a, a less than a less than a full container, so it'll be mixed mixed in with certain other products. Again, that price comes down, but it does depend on the mix of products in the shipment. Obviously, alcoholic products attract a higher rate um, than non-alcoholic products or, or or perishables. So again, that can vary between three, four, four hundred dollars to eight hundred dollars, depending on. On quantity, so the, the actual freight portion is variable in terms of the warehousing or, or the transport. Should I say to start with, there's a fixed pallet rate for collections from certain postcodes, and again that you know that will vary by producer depending on where your uh, manufacturing site is and the transport into Milton Keynes. Um, however, what I will say is whatever that rate is, that would be a fixed rate for collection um, and again that can be in the ballpark and this is more sort of specific to southeast or southwest of England um, if it's alcoholic products could be between um, 80 to 100 dollars 100 pounds a pallet um, if it's uh, also in England again it does vary where the postcode or the collection postcode is um, in terms of warehousing um, your Pallets will attract a storage charge per week. Again, and it's great that, again, if, if we're planning on bi-weekly bi or, or monthly shipments, if it's bi-weekly shipment, you'll, you'll attract a, a single week's worth of storage for, for a pallet. So the costs aren't too significant, um, but unfortunately, to answer the question directly, they are variable depending on, on market conditions at the time, the, the product itself and the point of collection. We, obviously, what we can do there is we can share more information afterwards rather than going into too much detail now. So if if there's specific questions of that ilk, you know, we're more than happy to, to take those offline. Uh, another question we have is how many how many units per SKU? Now, again, that that depends on um, for us is depends on what the product is, how how you know, the size, the you know, the pallet size. What we can do is then look to talk to you as a, a, a on a, a company by company basis, working out what we want to do and the ideal number for you in that store. Again, you you you're in you're putting this product into the store. It is very much it's an incubator service, so we're looking for you to be able to get into the into the market, work on work on the marketing, building brand, and then you, you being able to just work out if this platform works for you, what you want to commit to next time around on the next shipment, et cetera. But as I say, we're happy to work with you on a one-to-one -one basis to look at that and, and work out what's best for you at, in your own scenario. Um, Jim, we have one here. It's regarding duty payable as customer receives product. Would you like to take that one? Uh, with the help from my colleagues in Elanders, no problem. Yes. So the system is um, integrated. The uh, freight forwarding logistics system is integrated into the WeChat store. So the, they, they both talk to one another, to put it simply. Um, as the customer receives a product um, or orders the product, I should say, they're paying uh, local duties uh, related to whichever product they're ordering. Um, under the CBEC, the cross-border e-commerce system, um, each Chinese citizen has approximately five and a half thousand pounds sterling per year as an allowance for cross-border e-commerce uh, products. In terms of the mechanics of how that works, Kevin, did you want to uh, quickly chip in? Yeah, no problem. In, in general, most cross-border e-commerce transactions, uh, any duty is, is covered within the e-commerce e transaction. There are some limits, as Jim mentioned, regarding you know limit per order and, and annual spend. If Chinese consumers exceed those limits, then the Chinese consumer pays any extra duty. So it's not the responsibility of the the store or the uh, the producer. Hope that helps. Thanks, Kevin. Certainly. Thank you. Okay, and we have one final question at this moment in time, asking about sister companies and being able to put, offer two different brands offering different SKUs. The answer is yes, we would consider different companies. Um, we're doing that already. So if they're, if they're that far apart, happy to consider. 
please just get an expression of interest in so we can have a look and see what we can do. I think for that particular scenario, um, with, Paul, would you prefer two expressions of interest, one for each legal entity or one covering both? Definitely. Yep. Yeah, keep them comp completely separate. Okay, another one's just come in. How long? Will this initiative last? We're not expecting, you, as long as we have the British producers got the incubator, that the whole thing for us is about open uh, opening up a front for for you guys to be able to enter that market once you're in there then what we can do it hopefully attract a, a, a chinese importer distributor retailers that want to take your products once you've proven yourselves in that market so we are very much the first step into china for you what we're looking to do is have almost a rolling set of companies coming on. So you may be with us six months, you may be with us for a year, 18 months. We're not looking to turn this off. So hopefully that, that'll give you some, some comfort in the longevity of this project. Just to add to that, in terms of the medium to long-term vision, as Paul says, this is very much an incubator project. So it's, it's a facility to get your products into China and start to uh, assess the extent to which the, they resonate with Chinese consumers using the power of influencer marketing. In terms of what we define as success, well, really it's that you're moving beyond, within 12 months, your products, well, you, you move beyond this system and you're finding other distribution channels. So we, we really do mean this in the sense of we're very passionate about getting companies out there, exporting more, and this is just the start of the journey because the opportunity in China is, is huge and we can possibly cover that on uh, a webinar the, the length of today's. Thank you. Um, what, what, what I would do, I think, I think we've answered the questions. Just to, you know, there, there's no, no surprise really. You know, it's it's eleven eleven. It is Singles Day in China. Whilst this was going on, I was just looking at some figures and Sky are reporting at the moment. You know, Alibaba forty two billion pounds of sales. Um, JD.com have reported 23 billion. But you know, just Alibaba alone, it's six, you give you some idea of the, the size of the opportunity. You know, we know it's not all food and drink and it's across across the piece. But this one day is 16 times larger than the Amazon's prime day. So you're online we, we've said it all along, online is where it needs to go. Um, I've been involved with DIT and, and the international trade within to China for the last five, six years. Um, we've always said, you know, if you want to look at China, you've got to look at online. You know, what we've done now is rather than say, you know, you've got to look on, online and try and get yourselves to do it yourself as one, as a standalone unit, what we're doing is say, okay, we're going to create that vehicle for you, for you to start the journey. We're going to create that storefront and all the back office logistics support that we need and get, get, you, get you there rather than just pointing you in the direction. We're actually on that journey with you. So I think it's really important, you know, as, as Jim said, as, as all of our panel, this is this is something to start your your process, um, and we just you know, we hope what what we've presented today, you know, from the interest we've seen already, we know there's the interest there. We just want to see you know, this as success, and our success, as Jim said, is companies jumping off, but also the companies that maybe thought China was too difficult at this stage, seeing them succeed grow and get some recognition so you know, hopefully you're going to join us and we look forward to seeing products moving shortly thank you mark 
Thank you very much, Paul, and all of our panellists today. If you would like any more information, please email gbfpsw at mobile.trade.gov.uk. You can also see in the chat function the link for the expression of interest. On behalf of all of us at the Great British Food Programme and Business West, we would like to thank you for joining us today. Stay safe and have a good rest of your day. Goodbye. Thanks, Mark.